Hello, everybody. Um, this is the SIF roundtable called Breaking Traditions, and we are live. I'm Marina Ajaja, one of the senior programmers at SIF. Um, in keeping with traditions to be respected, SIF acknowledges that we occupy indigenous land, the traditional territories of the coast Salish people. And another good tradition to remind people is to vote for SIF's Golden Space Needle Award using the stars on each film page online. And your vote is important to filmmakers, so don't forget to do that. Now about round tables, which are very traditional. They started in 155 AD with King Arthur's, and he popularized the phrase with his group of advisors known as the Knights of the Round Table. A round table organized conversation with one moderator, several chosen speakers, and brings a variety of conversation um, with, uh, and perspectives to a subject plus an audience who may simply observe or participate by asking questions. The subject today is breaking traditions. Uh, by traditions, we mean organized, personal, family, or even filmic traditions. As we said in uh, online on our program, some traditions should be respected by us uh, but others should be retired or thrown under the bus. We invite you to a conversation between four dynamic directors about cross-cultural issues and changing visions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. So I'm going to introduce you to our four directors now with just a sentence and synopsis of their film. So please meet um, Tiona Struger, Metevska, Metevska, director of God Exists. Her name is Petrunia. This is Tiona's fifth film, correct? Yes. Yes, fifth film. Um, she was born in Skopje, Macedonia. She was a child actor, trained as a painter and graphic designer. She studied film at an MFA program in New York University. Tiona's film is about a young woman in a village who is determined to change her luck. Next person I'm going to introduce you to is Zsuzsa Dabrachkos, and her film is Bibia, Mon Soul Desire. I'm sorry, my French is horrible. Um, she was born in Soviet Union and she's a London-based writer, painter, and filmmaker. Bibia is her debut, and it is an intimate look at life and death in a family, but mostly it's a portrait of a girl who feels like she doesn't fit in. Amanda Cornell is a Swedish Southern Sami director of Charter, known for her film, Sami Blood, which we loved at SIF. She attended and graduated from the National Film School of Denmark in Copenhagen, where she now lives and where she teaches film directing. Amanda's film is about a mother who had to leave her kids with an abusive husband she could no longer live with, but that never stopped her concern for her children. Then we have Thomas Vingras with his debut Motherland from Lithuania. He studied at Columbia University and graduated from the Vilnius Academy of Arts and the American Film Institute Conservatory. Thomas's film is about a 15 year old American boy who comes with his mother when she returns to her homeland of Lithuania. 
So I'm going to start with my first question about traditions. You know that sometimes we just want to maintain traditions and sometimes we want to break everything that restrains us. It's kind of love-hate relationship with traditions. So let's break a tradition of ladies first and ask Thomas the first question. So Thomas, how important is tradition in your life? <clears throat> um, I think that uh, tradition is one of those strange things for me because I, um, uh, I was raised between two cultures. I had one foot in the US and one foot in Lithuania. I spent my summers over there as a child. And so, so to me, from a very early age, uh, tradition was this nonsensical concept because what I was told in the US was the way to go. I was shown the opposite in Lithuania and, and vice versa. So for me, my traditions are very small and very personal and, uh, and they're the things that maybe keep me grounded, but the broader scope of tradition uh, uh, has, has, has always been a complex question for me. Well, can you name two traditions that you, that you keep? Uh, two specific traditions that I keep. I don't know. Um, I, uh, I, 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 um, I guess from the, from the cultural perspective, I mean, I, <laughs> um, the, uh, last mushroom picking of the fall of the autumn in Lithuania is, is my, is something that I, every time I can, I do. Um, and, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll call it one. <laughs> okay. okay. That's good enough. Amanda, how important is traditions in your life? There are so many answers to that. Um, I'm from a Swedish Sami family and um, a Swedish mother and a Sami father. And um, the Sami traditions are uh, present in, in my life through him, uh, but they're sort of invisible in our society as a whole. I mean, the, the people, the, the stories, the way of living. Um, so I guess I grew up feeling like there were traditions and mm, you also call it the, sick, the silent language, but you know, how you show, how you interpret things and signs and what kind of clothes and an interpretation of things and places and uh, songs and I don't know that doesn't mean anything to people who doesn't know that this exists. Um, so I think I thought about in 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 terms of filmmaking because I both Charter and Sabi Blood are about women who make radical choices and they're based on real events. Uh, you could say. Um, combination of people, but very close to me. Um, and they're about women maybe breaking traditions or, or leaving a place. And um, I have a great interest in that, but also in actually places. I don't know if this is a part of traditions, but maybe because you give places meaning and they have their own songs and, uh, you know, you can make a place into a joke or a song and I think maybe making films is maybe like singing the song for this place or this person so for uh -huh. me I used to do this kind of singing or chanting and I now I make films instead but I think maybe it's the same way it's like making some a place or a person come to life for other people and you can bring it with you. Tiana? unmute myself um well um, you know it, it's interesting question because in a way traditions change with time you know with with uh, in terms of our personal growth so when i was little and when i was teenager uh traditions had to be broken so i was a rebel without a cause or with a cause growing up in the balkans 
uh, being part of growing up as a woman in a very uh, macho society, very macho environment. Uh, of course, I was uh, all the traditions were my greatest uh, um, walls to climb or greatest uh, frustrations. Uh, um, I was like a Don Quixote fighting uh, in order to exist. Um, I'm not saying that uh, that has much changed. If you <laughs> look at my films, in each and every film, I am dealing with uh, women uh, or men uh, rebelling against the status quo, against uh, the societal rules and uh, regulations, um, and as well as uh, as well as in Petrunia, but. Um, Today, being a little bit more mature, I do know that tradition, my tradition and my culture, it is what defines me in a way. But I'm also aware only by questioning who we are and where we come from and what the rules are, only by questioning uh, these rules can we advance as a society. So uh, I guess, uh, uh, yes, I, I question and question and question until I uh, maybe change one mind and maybe another and another and another. An excellent tradition. <laughs> That's my... <laughs> Zhuzha. Uh, yes, I, I, like you already mentioned, I was born in the Soviet Union and we did have kind of a lot of strange tradition, usually that crowd, you need to do everything in crowd, like demonstration or celebration, everything together, everything like, let's go together, let's do the same. It was kind of frustrating. I, I, I didn't take it like tradition, I took it like a rule, something. And then when I moved to UK, it's completely different type of tradition. We still have a constitutional monarchy there. And uh, this tradition, which is completely like for me, strange, it's <laughs> another century. It's like I'm from the Soviet, came to the monarchy. And, and I love it. I love it because it's completely theatrical. It's not serious. It's so, it's so unusual. It's like from another planet. And I loved it. I, and since then, I started to love any kind of transition, which doesn't make kind of sense. It's not because traditions for me, it's something you don't understand exactly what you are doing, but you need to do it because you told so. And uh, I started to love it. And I started to research for the different kind of crazy traditions in the different kind of countries and with different kind of people. And my film, Baby, which you also mentioned, it's kind of one of the film which based on the very strange, unique Georgian, and I'm not from Georgia, it's completely unknown country for me, Georgian traditions, uh, the youngest of the family, when somewhere, uh, someone dies, not at home, the youngest from the family needs to take the thread and connect the place of the death. For, for example, it's bad in the hospital, yeah? to the corpse. Otherwise soul, which left body in the hospital will never find the way to the corpse. And sometimes in my film, it's 25 kilometers of walking through the wild, wild land of Georgia with the thread, you know, you physically need to do it. And they still sometimes do that. And sometimes they do it like 300 kilometers. It's completely unbelievable, but it still exists in Georgia. And I think this kind of traditions, they're absolutely marvelous because you don't know what you're doing. You're doing something completely like crazy things, but through the crazy things, through them leaving your com comfort zone, you sometimes can find the truth. It's what happened in my film. You find something, you're doing completely, you, you kind of hate it, you go through it, you hate it, you don't understand it. And it's like, what, what is that medieval age? What, Sorry, I'm doing, and uh, but then you wow, you suddenly understand there is something in it. There is something happened to me when I'm doing it, and I, I believe tra tra traditions. It's kind of have very huge mystical uh, subject in them, which is uh, you just need to do it, and then you will see the changes. 
you don't need to understand what's going on. But there is some mystical part which I love in a lot of lot of traditions. And uh -huh. now I, uh, I I love traditions in the way I understand them. Uh huh. Uh, mm -hmm. And through through your film, you learn to love traditions. Is that no, no, no. N just in no, general, you love you love. But, but I, yes, no. I just uh, started to love them, and I did a lot of research and. I love to do the research for different traditions. For example, I love to study uh, burial traditions in the different country because they're completely, some of, of them, you, you can't even imagine what's going on. And, and through that, I found the, the good for my script. I found the amazing turn to my script. Like, wow, this is it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Let's take it. Let's take it. No one will uh -huh. believe it truly true tradition which is exist in Georgia. Okay, um, next question. Um, all four of you have films about youngish people who feel like they don't fit in. What do you think makes a person fit in and is fitting in necessary? Uh, Fiona. Um, you know, it's one of the first questions I ask, uh, I don't know why I talk about my teenage years, but it was a big, um, at one moment I had this dilemma and I spoke to my father. My father is a painter and I said, uh, Papa, uh, what do I do? How does one find the way? And actually it was a question about fitting in, belonging or not. And my father, who is a very wise man, he said to me, you know, there are two uh, roads in, uh, in the life, in your life. There is the common road, which is very straight. It is the road of the sheep. And it's very comfortable. You can choose this road and everything will be okay. Huh? And you will manage to get wherever you want to get and it will be fine. And there is the other road, which is the road of the koza. Um, uh, koza, uh, it is, you know, the animal that goes after the, 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 the um, um, well, it, it is an animal. Um, um, I can't remember the English koza, uh, the Russian lady, uh, Juja, do you know what koza is? No, she doesn't know. It's a, no, no, no. It's a, let's say it's a wife of gold. <laughs> exactly. It is exactly. Gold, the, gold. But Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you can choose the, the, the road of the goat. And actually, it will be a very hard road. You will have to climb a mountains and it will be very difficult. But you know, Teona, it will be your road. And on the end, possibly, maybe you will be happier. So. To answer your question, I know that we live in a, I have a teenager son. It's very difficult. There is so much pressure on young generations to fit in, to belong. But you see, belonging, oh, fitting in, actually, not belonging. Fitting in is the total opposite of finding yourself. And that's difficult. And you know, once you find yourself, then you immediately fit in you're accepted because you are something that has a value. So um, that's something that is true. So um, yes, I, I hope I answered your question. I yes. went all over. <laughs> no, wonderful. Uh, co cause a, a goat, yes. Exactly, cause a goat. Yeah. Thank you, Jaja, because mm -hmm. I knew we, we have, a, you know, Macedonian, Russian, it's Slavic language. We have a very common, uh, the basis of the word is very similar. Yes. Malinki Kozlik. Eh, Malinki Kozlik. Thomas. <laughs> yeah. I think that the the um, end of uh, of especially of what Tiona said is 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 the most important thing I think for me is as well as when you when you go your own path um 
I don't know if it means you automatically fit in, but fitting in doesn't matter anymore. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's human, it's in our nature and you see it very well in children to, to try to adapt and try to become a part of everything that's around you. And, 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 and uh, you wanna be part of the group. I think that there is a part of nature, but I think what makes life exciting is the people that do not. Um, and sometimes you're forced in circumstances that you don't fit in and you have to learn to deal with it. And sometimes it comes from some sort of inner, inner drive or, or, or parents or, or whatever it might be. But I think that um, taking the goat's path is, is absolutely the most, the most exciting <laughs> uh, path there is. And, and I think in my own case, I, I was in circumstances that made it difficult to, made fitting in a very confusing uh, uh, question, a confusing challenge. Um, because again, with the tradition, I, 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 I kept being thrown between two worlds and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier that I, that I was forced to, uh, to, to try to, to <laughs> I, I'm never gonna forget this goat, this goat metaphor, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, from now on, it's, it's all about the goat path. Um, yes, but you have to say cosa. Cosa, I'm sorry. The cosa path, I think is. Yeah. is uh, uh, Amanda. Um, yeah, I think that was such a brilliant answer. So um, I, maybe I can't say any more to that, but I, in, in, in writing this film with Charter, I, I'm from a family with generations of divorced parents and um, also with mothers who haven't had their kids. Um, and um, so I had to I had to write something about that and which is about fitting in or not fitting in because a mother that doesn't have her kids um, is it's um, it's uphill from there because I think we perceive that in a society as something's wrong with her so she either chose not to be with them and that's a great character flaw um, or she didn't have get them and then she, she, something's terribly wrong with her. Uh, and from there, from, from that point of view, from the audience in this case, but from, from society, it's hard to fit in. It's like, no matter what you do, you will either hold your kids too tightly or you will be too cold on them. Or, I mean, the, the, it's a very small path from there to try to fit in. So I've been, I've been deep down in that uh, rabbit hole for a long time. Uh, so I guess that's my only association to fitting in. Uh -huh. So we have rabbit and cause. Um, Zhuzha. Uh, because I'm red headed, I, I was immediately out of fit in situations, especially uh, with the kids. Sometimes it's very cruel. And I didn't even understand what's wrong, but something is definitely wrong because everyone mentioned it like all the time. And uh, specifically, I was in the family where none of my parents or grandparents were redheaded and kind of a lot of questions. Uh, even my grandmother had questions if I am seriously uh, biologically their daughter or not. And this is how my actually, because it's my first film, my debut, it's, it starts with my own pain, my own story when your own grandmother, because baby, the, the uh, name of the film is granny in English. If you translate it from Georgian language, baby, it's uh, granny, it's grandmother. And the grandmother didn't believe that the grandchild is uh, biologically uh, from their family and this is where all the story starts and uh, then we will see the main character she is 17 and she received the call that her granny is dead and she's supposed with a very hard feeling she's supposed to come to the Georgia not only to be in her funeral but to do this strange uh, tradition burial tradition we just mentioned uh, I I 
from the early beginning of my age, I, I believed I, I didn't fit in at all. And uh, it was a lot of fight. Every time you go outside, it's a uh, constant fighting for, for kind of defense. And, um, but after it's become your biggest, finally, I, I don't even remember when, maybe when I was 15, it started, wow, it's people from the, uh, from the, hey it's it's become love like pe people start to love your hair they start to love your difference they start to love your appearance and you kind of god just yesterday you told me I, i'm ugly well, what happened then and uh you you use it and i started to use it like uh, specifically like my arm even and uh, how in life you can change all the situation like game can uh, all the game like chess game we are playing all our life it changes all the time there is no rules sometimes like you're playing chess and oh no it's not chess anymore it's a tennis ah okay let's do that and it's um uh, i think fitting in it's it's very strange and everyone who i think even thomas he of course he was very young everyone from the soviet system actually <laughs> to <laughs> hate even the idea to fit in because they, they fit us in with the, with the, you know, with the force, you know, if you are, you're too tall, just cut your head. Ah, you're too small. Okay, we'll just break your leg and you will be the fit again. And I'm against it. And uh, it's amazing to find your, uh, your way. And if you are not harmed to people around you, you can do whatever you want. I'm very libertarian this way let's say and i'm against the fitting at all we are not going to the box of you know matches we, we are not matches anymore we are completely different that's that's why i asked is fitting in necessary um now to play off this this theme of fitting in um almost um all your characters, as well as all of you personally, have lived or live in more than one country and you've adjusted to other cultures. Um, how do you fit into two or more cultures? Um, Thomas, your young man in motherland had to adapt to two cultures, America and Lithuania. Um, he had to adapt to two parents what what are some of the adapt adaptation or adaptions that he had to make? I mean, I think the short answer is you 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 don't. I mean, you don't fit in, or or you don't fit into two cultures. You sort of fit into to the human experience. Uh, I, I I think that the character and and. Um, the character, and this is personal, I think even the actor who we brought over from Kansas, he lived in this, this small town in Kansas, uh, came, coming to Venice, you start, you start looking for the most basic human elements, human connections. You're not going to connect everybody. You're not going to fit in and, and um, uh, in the traditional sense. Uh, I mean, there might be some people, <laughs> I, I can't speak for the, the, the human race, but, um, but I think it's about because uh, uh, underneath everything we're talking about, all the traditions, all the the social, these are social constructs. You know, we we uh, you we're all human. Uh, you can always find that. I think one of for me personally, at a young age, I could travel anywhere and connect with anybody, be, not because I was fitting in, but because I, I had sort of thrown away the assumptions that so many people have about how you have to behave, and then you just try to connect to human beings. Uh, for for that that most basic essence of what we are, we we're all emotional creatures, and and we can all connect if we if we try. Thank you, um, Amanda. Um, you function in I think three cultures, um, and can you talk a little bit about the major differences between uh, Sami, Danish, and Swedish? cultures and similarities. Mm -hmm. um, 
It's a good question. I mean, I'm, I went to Denmark to go to film school. Actually, I just moved back to Sweden after 11 years or so in Denmark. Um, and uh, so in speaking of Swedish and Danish culture, I mostly know it from the film side and how, how you make films. And um, that's, that's what I've been doing there. And uh, the Scandinavians, I mean, I guess to you, the Scandinavian countries are alike, so, and we are. Um, but the film tradition is a bit different. Um, so that's the first thought that this strikes me. Uh, I think it's a, it also has to do with how you make conversation, because in, in Denmark, it's a culture where you like to disagree, uh, whereas in Sweden, we would like to agree on everything. Uh, which makes the way of working different. Um, and I like to, creatively, I like to work in Denmark um, because they would, I mean, in Sweden, if you're the director, they will do what you say. Uh, it, maybe it's also an Ingmar Bergman tradition, I don't know. And in Denmark, they will, you ask for something and you come the next day and they say, yeah, yeah, you said that, but we tried something else. But we think this is even better, maybe even more what you want. Uh, or, uh, and I, I think that's good for creative uh, work. I mean, if, if you have the same vision and the same, um, I mean, I have a clear vision on what I want to do. Um, and then um, the difference between Swedish culture and Sami culture, I mean, it's, it's a lot. I don't know how, to, where to, where to start, um, but in writing, I mean, charter is a, could have taken place anywhere, I guess, even though places are important to me. But I mean, a, a story of a mother losing custody of her children and then uh, kidnapping them or leaving with them happens everywhere. Um, uh, Sami blood was different because it was a more cultural specific story in a way, even though that those stories also happens everywhere, people changing identity and, and cutting all ties to their past and changing life. Um, but I guess in doing that, it was more obvious that I'm from a, another background because, and also what I'm writing now, which is also some Sami contemporary love story. Um, that some things are understood by a Sami audience, but not by the rest. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, complicated. Let's say um, this is making it too simple. It, of course, it's more complex than this, but in, um, in the context where I grew up and in the Sami context, being silence, silent is disagreeing. And in a Swedish, like Western context, I mean, we perceive it as if some, nobody said anything, I guess they agree. Which, um, of course, then if you do it as a film scene, people will interpret it in different ways, this silence. Mm -hmm. Or when you work together and half of the film crew is from the Sami community and half of them are from the Swedish and Danish. Uh, it's, there will also be a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah, that's just an example, but because I think silence is a very interesting thing to work with. And I, uh, I think in all of the films, I think I made around 10, 10 shorts or so outside of film school. They're almost always about people not having a language. And I don't know if that comes from, I speak a lot of languages, but I speak Sami very poorly because there's no one to talk to really around. Um, so maybe it's the loss of that, but they never really have a language for what they want to say. Uh, yeah, and then silence has a, is also a great interest of mine because you also speak in, in Sami terms of that silence is not just disagreeing, it might also be the only um, weapon you have when you have nothing else, uh, you, can all, you can use your silence. It's, a, it's like you cannot forgive someone. You can also use your sign, like not give people your information or your thoughts or your feelings uh -huh. as, an, as an act of resistance. But I mean, it's difficult to tell on film because people in, will interpret it differently. Maybe that's an answer. Yes, that's an answer. Zhuja.
I, I, I think I will agree with Thomas. I, I don't think I exactly kind of fit in in the, in the new uh, country. Before, actually, before um, uh, London, I lived in LA, in Los Angeles for eight years. But uh, then uh, I started to feel like it's a blessing things because it's uh, some kind of solitude. I have more time for for writing and for I I, I kind of uh, have I, I'm not so busy with the friends and community and I'm not so involved in the life around me and for example I I think Marina you supposed to know we have uh, amazing uh, poet Russian poets Brodsky and he for example he told and he lived in New York. And then Venice, he told that a writer's table is supposed to stay outside of the house for the better vision. And I think I, I feel myself like my, 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 my table is somewhere outside. I'm a little bit out, outside of everything now because I, I left Russia long ago and I, I, I'm not, when I, I'm in Moscow now, I don't feel like I'm at home. But in London, it's 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 very pleasant, respectful place. But it's still not home. But it doesn't matter. My home is inside of me. I am now. I, I move, and it's my motherland is inside, and it's easy. It's in my pocket, you know. And um, and I think it's uh, uh, Thomas right. It's important. Like we are human. We have the same uh, the same needs, the same hopes, the same things. We can. I easily can communicate with some other people, but uh, maybe the connection is not so straight, but I want to tell the, this film I did in Georgia, it's in Georgian language. I don't speak Georgian myself. I worked with a translator, but language, even languages doesn't matter. I, I just uh, hear the melody of the language and I thought, oh, it's probably will be mostly impossible. No, it is possible. And now I can now I can film in any country I want. I don't need the language itself. It's somehow manageable. That we, we feel and we probably communicate not only with the languages, traditions, and some there is some vibrations or I don't know energy or whatever you you name it. And uh, I uh, the longer I live, I, I feel it, and uh, I like it. I, I'm very on my mystical way in, in the life. And I, I love it. It's completely, Thank you don't need anything. Yes. Can I you add something? You don't oh. need yeah, at the same time. Yeah. Well, it was so interesting to, to hear you talk about this living in exile in a way, because I think also doing that for me, living in Denmark and writing something uh, about our, like tr our common history, like Sami Blood was, and mm -hmm. stories I grew up with from home, it made me, it gave me another gaze to be somewhere else, to be far away and then go back home. Uh, um, just like when you go traveling and you see things very clearly, how they hang the curtains and what they put the bread in on the, t you know, because um, when you're just at home, you can't see, I think you can, yeah, and you're too close. You're too close. You don't see the probably whole picture or something. I mean, it could also be good to be close, but I, they both have great values. I just thought the sense of exile also give you that sort of other perspective. And maybe for me, at least, it maybe has helped a little bit to, to dare to be brave. Mm -hmm. Fiona. Um, No. What is the question? Uh, the question is, uh, how do you fit into two or more uh, two cultures? I'm sorry, I, I just got so carried away. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful what you say. Uh, may I um, respond? Um, no, respond. Uh, sorry, I'm now speaking French. Uh, can I answer? For example, I, I think it's very interesting. I just want to say something to Amanda what you're talking about silence and interpretation of silence. This is, uh, 
It's a beautiful idea. I hope this is part of your next film. Interpretation, misinterpretation, also the language, the imprisonment of not having enough of language. All this is so essential and beautiful. So I just wanted to, to uh, well, I, I'm intrigued. Um, um, you know, um, Omnia mea me comporto, it's a Latin saying. I, I don't know if it's Socrates or Aristotle, I'm sorry if I, um, um, but everything I own, I carry with me. Huh? Uh, so this has been my uh, credo, my motto, uh, belonging um, uh, to one or more tradition. It, it is a bittersweet feeling. Uh, usually when I get very drunk, I cry. <laughs> of being a perpetual immigrant, you know, of my son belonging to four cultures. What does that mean? Uh, I become very excessively emotional. And then uh, I think uh, it's the most beautiful thing uh, in the world to, to, uh, to belong to the world. Huh? Uh, to to be able to to be curious and to be able to sort of function anywhere uh, it's a great privilege it's a great privilege that can be of course frustrating but if you take uh, frustration as a sort of a moving force you know what I don't understand I will understand what I cannot do I will do etc etc it can be actually a, a very positive movement. So uh, I, I think we live in a world where we more and more are part of many cultures. You know, we become citizens of the world and what is more beautiful than that? But again, this is a privilege, you know? There's so many, such a big part of humanity that is locked, that cannot move freely. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of work to be done regarding that. I, I just want to add something to that, if I may. I lived in another culture for many years, uh, off and on seven years, and I lived in a language bubble. You know, I didn't know the language, so I was silent for many, many years. And I think that this silence allowed me to view how they hang curtains, view how they make things, how, how, the, how things are culturally. Because, you know, I'm in a way against being silent all the time, but this silence helped me to understand the culture. And I began to feel like I actually didn't live in either place that I was a citizen of the world. It didn't matter that I didn't, that I no longer felt at home anywhere. It didn't matter because I felt at home, as Zhuja said, in my pocket. You know, I felt at home. So um, let's talk a little bit more about um, the film itself. Um, one of the most important collaborations on set is the interaction of director and director of photography. How do you find the right cinematographer to work with? And how do you know it's the right person? So let's start with uh, Amanda. Uh, wow, I thought you would give me more time to think about that. Um, <laughs> hmm. Uh, I've been I've been working with all these I don't know if they're around ten shorts with the same DOP um, that I started making films with when I was nineteen and um, so we sort of grew grew up into filmmaking together in a way but then I made the two feature films with Sofia Olsson, um, Tommy Blood and Charter and she went to the Danish film school just like me and finished when I started. Yeah, how do you know? I think I had a feel, I mean, I had seen what she'd done. She made a lot of films on Iceland and that I guess I connected with coming from a place where nature means something 
or it's um, both an externalize. You can use it use it to externalize something inside of a character, but also as an actual physical force or resistance. Um, and she had filmed, yeah, on Iceland and New Zealand and so on. So I guess I felt connected to that. Uh, and then I I met with her. And she saw, I had done some early castings two years before shooting. I'd found these two real sisters for Sami Blood that I wanted to film. And I showed her the, I don't know if she wants me to tell people this, but it, it, she, I showed her the casting tapes and she started to cry. And, and um, it's something about her that she, I felt she was the right person because she, <laughs> she, she believes she is the main character, I think. The other DUP that I work with, he's also really good, but he has another distance. Like he looks at the world and she thinks she is the person, which was good for that film. And also for Charter, even though it has another aesthetic. So maybe that. And then I promised myself after hearing another a Danish director telling me that many years ago, uh, that the most important thing with people you work with is to choose people who minimize your your feeling of shame uh, so you feel because if you feel shame for expressing an early idea that is maybe a bad one maybe it, it is something to it somewhere inside of it but it sounds cheesy or dumb or but if you stop yourself from doing that and testing ideas because you feel shame you will not dare to do anything you know, interesting. Very wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Tiona, cinematographer. Um, I, um, I was just actually, uh, yesterday I came back from Denmark. I'm preparing my new film and I have a co-production with Denmark and I met a collaborator. And uh, after our uh, long talk, uh, the producer asked me, uh, what do you think? And I said, um, I don't feel intimidated by him. Therefore, I can work with him to join what Amanda just said. Um, this being said, um, uh, you know, um, cinematographer, it is a, it, it's a marriage, really. I mean, choosing your collaborators, it is a marriage, you know, a marriage for the six, uh, eight, nine months you're making this film, preparation after, etc., cetera, et cetera. So it, it must be, a, a, well, somebody who uh, either a common soul or somebody who pushes you to go where you don't dare. It is this kind of, uh, I guess um, it is a, it's, a, it's about the poetry you could create together. Um, I have worked with few cinematographers and I have learned the hard way. I cannot work with a man and not nothing against a man cinematographers, but me with my background, I, um, I don't know. I, <laughs> for me, it becomes this crazy. Well, the two ex three experiences that I have, it, they became sort of like, um, um, I don't know, competition. Uh, maybe I was not lucky enough. So then I met my woman cinematographer who was a true, true uh, beauty of collaboration. And then uh, a marriage happened, creative marriage. And then I have been working with her ever since. And it is about, yes, about daring, about listening to one another, about uh, uh, really not being afraid to, to, to do stupid things and to, to try to find the miracles. And then it, it is also, as every collaboration is, it is about humility. Humility, because you know, as directors, you know, I, I agree. I, I don't know why tonight I'm agreeing a lot with Amanda because maybe I have been spending a lot of time in Denmark. But you know, I, uh, I love this uh, sort of way of working in Denmark where you're not the God as a director, that uh, 
that people dare to say to you, okay, but have you thought about this? And then it becomes this true collaboration, exchange of ideas. And it is, uh, yes, it is, uh, of course, you don't have to take every, everything that is suggested to you, but it is uh, this moving thing, uh, moving thing that, that uh, yes, can go beyond uh, yourself, greater than yourself. And art is this, about reaching, creating something that is larger than your little self. Thank you, wonderful. Zhuja, about cinematographers. Yes, yes, I, I, I was listening, uh, I understand. Uh, about cinematography, it's, it's uh, because it's my first film, I didn't do any short, I, I didn't do anything, I, I didn't study in any uh, film schools, I completely self-taught director, uh, but I, I know how to draw and I know how to write. Uh, and um, I, I, before I even choose my cinematographer, I, I did all my storyboards, for example, now I do the storyboards for the new films, it's kind of the pictures like that, in, in each scene I have my own pictures, which I, I drew kind of all, all films together and I understood uh, I, I, I can work with, a, for example, static camera is not a problem for me because I already know I saw my film inside of my head. I just picture it all together, but I was looking for specific, specific knowledge of movement inside of the scene because I, I wanted to make the film in documentary style, uh, let's say like dogma style. And I wanted to, to, it's to make kind of very documentary. And to find uh, this kind of cinematographer, it, it's, it's not so easy because it's a specific knowledge of documentary cinematography. When you just kind of, you're looking for your subject but it's not supposed to be pretentious, any movements, it's supposed to be natural and it's supposed to be not kind of, it's, it's very specific, I think, things. I was looking in my cinematographer. I, I watched many, many, many short movies, films, the big films. I spoke to many, many cinematographers and finally I saw the small, like 10 minutes short film from I think it was on La Carne Film Festival, short like this. And I, I, I didn't even understand the film itself, but I am like, this is the movements I, I love. I didn't, I, I, did, I, I know nothing about this person. And I immediately wrote a letter to her and she said, no, I'm, I'm it, it's her. She's uh, Veronika Solovyova. She told me I'm busy, I can't, no, but, but finally I talked, I talked and I talked and finally we decided to do that. And it's, it was click from, from the first. <laughs> first day from first moment. I loved what she, she does. She, we, we kind of understood each other like we always work together. And it's, I believe it's just a luck. It's her amazing, uh, uh, her amazing- uh, Movement. Yes, and uh, luck because personally you need to speak on one language. You, you need to be, because it's, Everyone knows it's it's tough work to do. You have problems like every five, 10 minutes, huge one, like the, the last one on the set. And you need to be with a person who is a very kind of comfortable soul for you. And uh, I was lucky I found it in my first movie and now we are looking forward to the next one. And we are completely like, I like it. Thank you. Thomas. <clears throat> um, all, all I can do is uh, agree with uh, different elements of what everybody said. I think that the most important thing is, 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 is really to have that emotional connection. I think it's, um, especially in European film, with when all these co-productions start and they're like well look at who this what this person shot and look at what that person shot and this person is great and it, none of that i mean sure it's it's good but but having the um 
having someone who, uh, whatever word you want to use, spiritual love, marriage. I mean, it's 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 that it's that connection that goes beyond the technical. And of course, you can you can build a uh, uh, you can work and you can find the common language and everything like that, and and it's work. Um, but uh, but that's you know that's what a real collaboration is is finding someone where you you uh, you feel supported and you can that's when you can be creative. Uh, the technical knowledge is everything they teach you in film school and all of that is is fine to have, but but to to be creative and to do something interesting. You need to be in a comfortable environment. I have a close friend who said he needs to he needs to have at least one person close to him on set that he loves, truly deeply loves, because otherwise you can't you you're going to be restricted uh, in your creativity. And I think that that's very that's very true. Um, the way I found my my cinematographer on on Motherland. We connected because he was a documentary filmmaker and I wanted to have someone with a different eye and someone who could just have a slightly a, a different approach to things. Um, um, but yeah, I think at, at the end of the day, it is so we're, we're so often taught to, to, to make decisions by these rational, uh, rational things, you know, look at this person's experience, look at this person's whatever resume, all the festivals. But I, I think that relying on gut and emotions is something that, that we, we, aren't, we aren't taught to do enough. Thank you. Um, and I'll just throw this question out and anyone can answer. Um, how does the visionary process begin for you? Do you see scenes? Do you see the opening or the ending? How, how do you, how does it begin for you? Anybody? Uh, because I already started this topic. Uh, actually, when I uh, write the story, I already see the, the like a lot of pictures because for me, maybe because of my art, art uh, sorry, it's my dog artist uh, background <clears throat> i i see the film like a million of uh pictures it's still each frame it's so important for me it's like each frame it's supposed to be masterpiece itself and uh when i'm writing i already see some pictures and after i finish the script like till the very best i can i start to to do a lot of drawings it's drawings and drawings and i I kind of, I have the books of the film uh, where all the, and by, 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 by doing that, it's, it's kind of, I already see the, kind of, I, I see the film inside of me and I'm drawing it and I can change it, of course, if something happens, if, um, but it's um, maybe because I, I studied all my life, like to be a, uh, artist, I, I, <clears throat> I visually very easy to, for me to imagine the picture is not a problem at all. Just to, to draw it, just to fix it and then, yeah. Amanda? Uh, yeah, I also draw pictures from very early on. I'm not a good, I'm not good at that though, but um, I think film, I mean, it's strange. I'm I'm an educator, both both scriptwriter and director. But it's strange still for me, even though I love writing scripts, that you go through text to make film because film is time and space, and maybe body and gaze, and none of that could truly be captured in in text. Um, so uh, I I do a lot of interviews because it starts usually with some very personal experiences or in my family or people close to me and memories of that and other people's memories. So I ask them what pick, what images they remember. And then I, I guess they go through me. So some, both some blood and charter are in a way a collection of other people's memories and maybe my dreams. And so someone has been cutting their ear, ear like in Sunny Blood and 
someone, yeah, someone saw their mother through the the back in the back seat of a police car, um, and mm -hmm. so on. And then I draw them to remember them, and then I write um, uh, a manifesto for uh, for the film very early on, like when I have a synopsis for some some rules. I believe, like, what do I want to achieve, and how do I want to do this? Um, also, to remember not to lose myself in plot, or so. and it's also a way of making, like, in, inviting. Because I don't see every frame, um, maybe because I'm not a trained artist or painter, or um, so I rather want the the other, like the DOP and other creative functions, to come with ideas for some things. Like, how do we make this film? Mm, like in 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 Sami Blood was important. It was a subjective film that it was the opposite of these like totals of by the anthropologists, where you're. Uh, where the, the Sami people are like extras very far away from the camera and it had to do the opposite of that and with this film it was important to find both um, a, a nightmarish state like the fear what's the primal fear of losing your children what is that in what does it look like and uh, and then I I meet with the a functions pretty early on while writing and then they get, they have like little assignments <laughs> and we talk about their examples from other films and so on. So that's also a way of maybe being a director, trying to be a director at the same time as writing it and trying to like switch my hats back and forth. Uh, Thomas? Um, it's such a hard question to, to answer, I was thinking about it. Um, there's certainly short films that have started from just an image. Um, but I feel like I have, so, um, and, 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 and so many times, you know, I have these just, uh, it's my, my big thing. I, I try to organize all of these ideas because there's things that just build and develop and, and it'll be a sentence or a quote or, or an image that'll start it and then, but you lose track of that and these other things come in. I mean, the, 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 one of the main sort of moments that inspired this film that I rem was a memory uh, that's not in the film, it's nowhere near the film. It's, it's, it was written out. Um, but I think that it, it is, as, as a film develops, you, at least for me, it, it, it becomes more, it, it has a certain solidity or it becomes, it starts to take shape in, in various ways. Um, but I, I, uh, I really like what Amanda said about, um, it's something that I, that I try to do and I think everybody, I, th I think it's very helpful to, to just have that focus of what you are trying to accomplish with the film because it's so easy to, so easy to, to, to get, get lost along some way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, we could talk about this for hours, but, but it's it's uh, it's an interesting question. Tiana, um, yes. Well, um, I uh, I personally I prepare uh, each film for a very long time, um, but uh, how do I come to the ideas? Um, I guess uh, it has to do with urgency. Uh, it is uh, something I have heard, something I have seen, uh, some idea that I'm aware of that I must react to, you know. Uh, each film is like you do it or you die. For me, uh, basically, if I don't feel this urgency to make this film right now, right at this moment, I, I just cannot be good at it. Um, um, I dream a lot. Uh, strangely enough, uh, many of my scripts have been, uh, well, developed, finished, uh, started in my dreams. Sometimes it's daydreaming, sometimes it's really dreams. I solve so many problems. Uh, when I tap into this world uh, of the dreams, I guess maybe at that moment, 
I'm uh, most inhibited and I feel most free. Um, um, and um, yes, it, it is, a, uh, yes, it is an extremely complex journey. Sometimes uh, when I think of a film or constructing a film, it's like uh, catching the soul of the, the story, you know? Um, and um, I guess uh, you use the cinematic form in order to, yes, to tell the soul or to deliver this experience of this story or of, of this soul. And it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes it is a very mathematical way because uh, I guess uh, everything starts and finishes with mathematics. Even the most impossible ideas, you can actually find the logic within. So it is a beautiful, it's a child's game. You know, we are so lucky to be able to play. And uh, sometimes we succeed uh, better and sometimes not. But as long as there is this urgency and this freedom of a child's game, uh, it is, a, yes, it is a beautiful process. And uh, yes, and to, to be able to dream things, yeah, that's nice to also. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in Seattle, we were lucky enough to have the writer Stuart Stern, author of Rebel Without a Cause and Rachel Rachel, um, living in Seattle for many years. Uh, he taught a script writing class for years and he had a theory about bringing your character through splat. And what he meant by splat was trauma, bringing your character through traumatic, through their trauma. Um, all of your characters in all of all, all four of your films go through splat. Um, tell me, why is it important to bring the character through splat? I can answer first, okay. very quickly. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, splat is what uh, defines us, you know? We are who we are today and what we do, uh, um, it is based on uh, past experiences, traumatic uh, or not, um, based on splats. And so do uh, our characters. So uh, um, I, I don't see how you can do it otherwise. Amanda? I'm thinking about different um, definitions of, of so stories and why we tell them and thinking back on film school and <laughs> my professor. Um, and, he, and he used to say that um, stories are and films are always about loss. It's about a fatal loss and a possible loss. And I think, and how to learn to deal with that. And in a very Danish way of talking about stories, I think it's for me, it's very Danish because you know, in, in Sweden, we're more preppy and shy and maybe and not in Denmark. And um, they say that films and stories are, this, that is a misconception that drama is about conflict. They say now drama is about scandals. Something scandalous has happened and then somebody has to do something scandalous to change that or to do something right. But, so that's the Danish way of talking about stories. Uh -huh. I don't know why that came to my mind, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I guess um, for me at least, I think I I'm, I'm very interested in betrayal and what can be forgiven, and I think I have to deal with it because I. I, I know it says in the manifestos for the last three films um, that the camera should be on the betrayer's side 
like we should be on the betrayer side whoever i mean if it is a, is it is it a betrayal i'm not sure but maybe it is and i guess i ultimately i'm wondering if this was me maybe it is or maybe it's you but would i be forgiven for not sacrificing myself completely as a mother even though you have kids or where where's the where to draw the line or yeah, the questions are different but mm. So I guess that's one reason to, uh, for me at least, to, to tell stories and make characters go through difficult things and maybe not always being the hero in everyone's eyes. Zhuja. Uh, yes, I remember one, one day um, I, uh, I, prepare myself to take my son to school and suddenly all the shoes were small and I'm like what the hell how it's happened during one night all the shoes are small and uh, then uh, when I started to notice that he is growing like not not how you call this not gradually but kind of like this and finally I thought, oh my God, yes, it's true. He kind of the same, the same, the same, and like, boom, wow. He's tall or big or smart or something like that. And, but then I understood what makes us, us. We, we are not gradually change our characters, but this, let's call it splats, the steps, and usually it's steps to hell, <laughs> makes us, us. It's, you immediately grow, like yesterday everything was fine and then bam, and you are different. And this makes us, us, us. And uh, actually we all, I believe our films kind of have a lot of similarity in probably in synopsis or something in, in the atmosphere. And we're all talking about this, what makes character, what makes us to do that or not to do that? What makes our character sometimes tough and sometimes weak. The splats, splats, chain of splats. Chain of splats, <laughs> perfect chain of splats. Thomas. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a wonderful chain of splats should be written above every uh, <laughs> software program <laughs> when you write a script. It's, I mean, but that is, that is life. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a one of the one of those things where you can look at it. I guess I, I don't have that much to add. I think I, everybody said it so beautifully, and and I even wrote down several quotes. This is my own little uh, second film school. Um, but uh, yeah, when you look at it from a script standpoint, I mean, the, our goal as as filmmakers, I think, is you wanna you wanna wake people up a little bit. You want people to empathize. You want people to open their eyes and. and because most people, uh, it's it's very easy to just live your life without without paying attention, and and I think that this is one way that uh, you you trigger someone's empathy. And and I don't think for any, I, I would assume that it's not like an intentional. Like you're sitting at the script, and you're like, okay, how am I gonna traumatize this character so that the audiences will wake up? I don't think that's what it is. I think that's why we connect to our characters as well. Um, but I think that's why it is such an important element in, in storytelling. Okay, I ask another question um, of all of you and whoever would like to, to chime in can. Um, what, is, what do you think is the most important quality of a film director? Um, I, I, I want to. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, because recently I, I, I read a quote from uh, Federico Fellini. He said uh, the film director is like uh, Columbus himself. He is, uh, he wants to discover, okay, India, at least America, but all the teams want to go home. And this is actually usually the case. For you, it's everything. You put on table everything. You 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 absolutely like Tony uh, told us. You you die or you win. That's it. It's all 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 your life on the table. And 
actually, I am I, I, very uh, happy because it's contagious. You can infect people with your beliefs. And this is, I think, what uh, the most, uh, the biggest quality of film director, to be so passionate and so, um, you need to sparkle to be able to kind of to fire other uh, people of teams and kind of to be able to to take everything from them but don't give up anything of yourself and this is very difficult qualities is, is as well you need to listen you need to take something but definitely not not give up your original feelings or ideas or otherwise it will be very difficult and messy and um, yes, I think the mostly to be crazy about the filmmaking and to to spread it around you. This is the most important thing. To be Columbus. Anyone else? Oh, by the way, and he cheated too. You know, and I think you can as a director cheat. Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else to answer that question of? Well, I'll, I'll read you a quote of a famous director said, don't listen to your parents, don't listen to advice, don't listen to culture, trust your feelings, use the force. That was George Lucas. Um, tell me, what is the best or worst advice you've ever gotten as a director? Tiona. Uh, I have a I have a horrible experience when I made my first feature film. This was many years ago, maybe 17, 18, 19 years ago. Um, at that time we didn't have in Macedonia any women film directors. Uh, and most of the crew was men over 50. Um, and um, uh, I really had a hard time to be taken seriously. It was me and my sister and we, you know, it's like, what are they doing? She comes from New York, who she thinks she is. And, uh, and uh, I remember, it, it's actually the, the, it's a, the film is How I Kill a Saint. And um, it's the, the, one of the first scenes uh, when uh, this uh, girl comes home in her house. So I'm setting up the scene. There is like this really long tracking shot. A uh, shot, uh, uh, there is like this very complex uh, mise-en-scene uh, with seven characters, the whole family, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes a whole day, you know, to, to set it up and to shoot it as I want. And at one moment, my driver, who I like, you know, the driver who takes me to the set and back, comes to me. And he says to me, listen, Teona, I must talk to you. I say, okay, you know, I'm trying to shoot the scene, but okay, yes. And he said, you know, we've been talking downstairs. I must tell you, it is very bad and very wrong, everything you do. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> making film, making cinema is like this, like this, like this, like this. I don't understand what you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh, it is the worst <laughs> thanks god i did not listen to him but uh, uh yeah it, it it actually traumatized me for years to come uh because it uh, it took me two films to to have the courage and to be myself uh and dare dare be myself and do my film because from the moment of these words of this man, uh, I, I spend most of my energy, uh, instead of making the film, I spend my energy proving to this man on the set that I'm capable and able. Yeah. So uh, I hope this doesn't ever happen to anybody, any woman or a man ever again. I mean, um, uh, I, I wish I could give you a good advice. Good advice is uh, my DOP. She said to me, I, I made uh, the first film we made together. 
And she said to me, I don't understand you, Teona. She's a Belgian French. You know, if you want, you can go on the set completely naked with very high heels, red high heels, and you're the director and everybody has to follow you. So that little bit released me and, uh, and uh, gave, me a, gave me a license not to go naked with high heels, but at least not to try so hard to satisfy the men. <laughs> Great. Amanda. Mm. Oh, it's difficult. I think um, a recent one I heard uh, from a, a, a script supervisor was when they say, because I've been in these discussions a lot of times about female male char main, main characters, that people want to be nicer or more likable. And he said, when they say make her nicer, I say no, make her more compulsive. That's more interesting. <laughs> um, that helps me sometimes to think, okay, maybe because because people want people also tell you to change your main character, and I think especially if it is a woman, a female main lead character, and she's not doing the right choices all the time. People also want to help her, which is, and now I had a mother character, and people really want her to be a good mother, so they want to change everything she's doing wrong. They think she's doing wrong in the script, that it should be changed. And sometimes you also confuse, I think, also me listening to feedback, that when people want to change something, maybe that is a feeling that the audience should have. Maybe you shouldn't change it. Maybe that's a good thing that people want to, you know, act in and train, do something and discuss it. Um, so I guess at least I'm in those discussions a lot <laughs> about scripts. So I, I need to be reminded about that. And then a director friend of mine who many years ago said, you can either be really good at plot like craft work or be very good at being very honest. And I don't know if, I think you can do both, but it's, I think about it sometimes just to remind me that, that it, it is a true force in trying to tell something honest, like, uh, and therefore you need to surround yourself with a sense of shame. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Zhuzha. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of experience because it's just first film. Uh, but uh, I, you, you need to know where you go and you need to believe mostly in yourself. Because uh, I, I, when I, when we started to shoot first, first few days, and I specifically choose very uns, kind of we specifically choose very uh, not standard compositions. Sometimes in our frame, two people speaking like mouse here and mouse here, or sometimes you can see the the heads at all. And kind of it it was it was my goal to to kind of mm, little bit explore somebody's brain, little bit to to kind of wow, oh, what is this? Oh, ah. Uh, kind of it was the style of uh, the things, but the group team of the people who didn't specifically the people with the uh, lighting and stuff around that who probably didn't even read, read the script. <clears throat> they had a lot of questions and they came one by one to me in the some breaks or in the lunch break or after work like Zhuzha, are you sure on what I do? Are you, are you definitely your first time director? Maybe after you, you will tell us, why didn't no one tell me I'm doing wrong? Why didn't, why you didn't stop me? You, I'm first time director, maybe. And I said, relax, relax. And, but it was so many people who didn't believe in, in that, that it was moment like maybe Zhuzha, something really wrong goes something. But then I said, no, 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 no. You're right, believe in your beliefs, in your manifest, in your whatever you create and go and don't listen. Don't just, don't listen. You know what you are doing. 
Uh -huh. George Lucas, George Lucas is right. Don't listen to anybody. Uh, Thomas, want to add anything? <clears throat> um, when I first got to LA um, for film school, my my sister's uh, husband put me in touch with this this big guy, big name. He had directed, uh, you know, big Hollywood features, and and it, he agreed to meet me for coffee. And, uh, and the first thing he said uh, was, don't do it. And uh, <laughs> so I still don't know if it's good, best or worst advice. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, but that was the first, <laughs> the first advice I got from this, this, you know. And, you know, and then he let me do script coverage for him, which is the worst job in the world and didn't pay, <laughs> obviously. Um, uh, yeah, that was miserable. No, I think everybody. I think uh, uh, everything's been said. I think that that uh, what Tiona said is is in and in so many words, the best advice I've gotten. You know, don't try to please anybody. Don't if you're on set, if you're making your movie, it's, what's the point? If you're if you're doing this for someone else, just don't do, just then then that advice stands. Then just don't don't do it. If you're doing this for anybody else, well. I would like to thank you all um, for your efforts, for um, being here, for letting SIF show your films. Um, I will make sure that we all get a link, that you get a link for each other's films and that you can watch. And I hope that we continue, that we communicate after you've viewed maybe. Um, Thank you so much for your time, for, for your films. Uh, keep working. Uh, keep, Thank you. Keep being goats. <laughs> Cause Thank it's, you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, okay. Uh, Thank you so much. It's been a very, uh, um, Thomas has been smart to write things down, you know. Yeah. If you can send me your notes. I'll send you my notes. <laughs> I would actually love them because I, I, I feel so much richer from uh, listening to you all. So thank you. Yeah, that's thank wonderful. You. And ho hopefully this will show on YouTube. And I'll let you know when that, you know, not right after the festival, but eventually and i'll let you know what were you going to say amanda no i just said i'm i'm so happy to have been a part of this um round table I'm, i feel so inspired and um i definitely feel like the don't do it advice doesn't stand because i feel like <laughs> they, this is <laughs> this is uh, this was so inspiring makes me want to go and make more films oh that's wonderful that's wonderful i'm so glad to hear that really Okay, goodbye all. I hope Bye. to see you Bye, everybody. Thank you.